Moxie in Atlanta, and that's at 5.30 tonight. 
If you plan on coming to that session, just FYI, Brad Paisley is going to be having a concert right next door. So um, think about parking, think about Ubering, walking, etc. Okay? Um, but let's get started. We got a, a great session. So Chance has flown in from Los Angeles. So from Los Angeles to Knox Vegas, right? He is here. And he brought family too, which I think is so fantastic. So thank you all for coming. Grandparents and mom are here to support, which I think is just so wonderful. Um, Chance works at Sidley, an agency in LA, but the majority of his talk is going to be how he went from sitting in the seat you're in <laughs> to where he is today. And he was in the very first social media class um, in spring of 2012. So great to see him and welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's really good to be back. Um, I was in Tennessee recently in November and it was it's totally different moving away and then coming back. It's like really, truly home now. Um, so a couple of years ago, I was sitting right where you're at, um, wondering how the hell I'm going to get a job in advertising whenever I don't really know exactly what I want to do. You know, I knew I wanted to be creative in some way. I knew I wanted to, you know, be really good at the business itself, um, but never felt like truly like prepare to take that on. I don't think anyone really does until you get into it. So um, through a lot of luck and networking and hard work, you can turn any experience into quality advertising experience. The more you know about the service industry or the, the industry that you're gonna be working, the clients that you have, the better off you're gonna be. So you have to immerse yourself in that. Um, so I'm gonna kind of detail a little bit about how I got to where I'm at now, and it's through a series of emails. Um, I don't know if, how many of you had uh, had Laura as a teacher last year or last semester. Yeah. All right. She's a great professor. She spoke at the very first social media week, uh, social media class, which I was in, and made that connection. It's a really important connection that I had. From, from that day until where I'm at right now. Um, I also used to work at Sunspot back whenever. <laughs> it was uh, the old building. I don't, you guys probably don't even know the old building, right? It had a lot more character. It was <laughs> a lot of character. It was rickety and, and had a lot of, just had the texture. Um, but that, that experience was, was what got me to where I'm at now, that, that restaurant experience. So. Um, I'm going to start with this video of Sid Lee, where I'm at now. It doesn't necessarily fit in other than, um, than letting you guys, oh, now it's moving. Um, other than just like letting you know a little bit about where I'm at nowadays and uh, let you know that I've, I've been working as a community manager on Netflix for the past two years. We just finished up uh, working on that account uh, back in the end of January. But if you follow Netflix for the past two years, I've been the one like kind of talking to you guys. Um, it was a lot of love and hard work and a lot of attention. Um, so here's Sid Lee. This is the agency that I work for now, and then I'll get into like the real deal, like how to get to where I'm at right now.
guys are properly hyped up. <laughs> um, so we just went through this big rebrand, uh, just to give you some background on that. Um, completely changed everything. It looks really good. Uh, that is a taste of, of the work that we do. So Sidley's headquartered in Montreal, so a lot of that stuff is Canadian. Um, it's really hard to show social media stuff on a reel. Um, so the stuff that I did for Netflix was just daily community management and creative um, is kind of the way that we ran it. Uh, I'm just gonna go to this slide for a second and talk about <laughs> Netflix. Um, so, do you, <laughs> yeah, um, this goes back to the Sunspot experience right now. Um, so, running Netflix was so much fun, but at the same time, the most mentally taxing thing I've ever done. I had, I had no attention span. I'm still extremely ADD because of this. Um, so, I don't actually have any Netflix work in here. To, to let you guys know. So if you have any questions about what daily community management is like for a major account, ask now. <coughs> any questions? Do you guys, does anyone want to be a community manager? No. <laughs> so I've got a question uh, from a community management standpoint internally with your team. Did you have, for example, did you come up with creative concepts and then collaborate with designers or content writers? Um, and, and, or did Netflix have those assets internally? Maybe talk through some of that. Yeah, of course. Um, so the, the team structure for Netflix internally at CP was very different from everything that they do, basically. So they, they kind of um, casted this, this team purely based on like personality. I had to interview with Netflix to get the job at CP. Um, it, was a really, it was a true partnership, which I think is absolutely necessary to do anything right for social media. I think, you know, people that are that are doing it right that you guys probably know of are Moon Pie, run by the Thomas Group. They have that's that's pure trust. They can do whatever the hell they want and like it takes that kind of relationship with a client nowadays to actually do social media the right way. Otherwise you're gonna be you're gonna be doing advertising on social and that's like the worst thing you could possibly do. It just doesn't work that way. You wanna get attention and conversation. It's like the most important thing that you can do. So the team structure for Sid Lee was um, community manager at the center. So typically, you know, you go into social media, it starts out kind of like old school is entry level position, like right out of college. That's like kind of where it started, but social media has kind of progressed past that at this point. It's, it's not an entry level position anymore. You know, it, it you become, the voice of a brand, you're given supreme trust and control over the presence. And that takes, it takes a little bit of experience to be able to do that and do the right thing. Um, so I was centered at the, at, at, the, at the center, controlling the conversation and working directly with clients, which is not something that a typical ad creative does a lot of the time. They don't get helped back by the, the bureaucratic account management. But I had constant communication with the Netflix team. Like I said, true partnership. So we're on Hangout, Google Hangouts all day long, just you know, messaging back and forth about things that are happening right in the moment. So we can then turn it around. I, I have a partner, uh, an, an art director partner, and he and I would come up with, with concepts ourselves. And we would work with an editor. Most of the stuff was very video focused or just copy focused. So it wasn't a lot of design needed unless it was animation or you know, little, little elements that, that we, we could put into the videos, but really heavy focus on, like, on the, the quality of the editing itself. So the team was account supervisor, community manager, art director, editor, motion designer, and that was it. I mean, we didn't, we you know, baked in strategy with the core team, um, but we only worked on Netflix. So we worked on Netflix, like, just that was the only account that I had, which is tough and fun, but also like causes you to become that. So for the past two years, I've felt much more Netflix than Sibley. And 
it's, it's, a, it's a tough to work, like tough to manage whenever you're internal because the process is so totally different than than anything that you would experience at the agency itself. So the, the regular process kind of gets thrown out the door um, because we have to work really, really fast. And if you know anything about Netflix, have you guys ever heard of the culture doc? So it gets passed around LinkedIn all the time. I highly recommend reading Netflix's culture doc. It's like pure Kool-Aid is what it is. Um, you, you read it and you become, you, you just, you become Netflix. It's, it's one of those things where you can't, you can't not take something away from it, but they carry that with them in everything that they do, which is kind of fascinating and scary at the same time. Um, so that, it, it was uh, this core team, to answer your question, um, when we worked, we just spent every hour of the day working on that. Um, any other questions about Netflix? Can you still watch it? <sighs> Not right now. <laughs> no, I've, I've been taking a break, but I did just start watching Everything Sucks, which I highly recommend. It's really good. I'm gonna take this water. <laughs> um, so it was, it was tough to watch for work, but it was also nice to know that you could get paid to watch Netflix. <laughs> but it was never watching for enjoyment. It was always watching to kind of come up with ideas and anticipate what people liked. <clears throat> like that was the tough part because like we would like to be ahead of everything and know what everyone is gonna, like know what everyone's gonna talk about after the fact, but you can't, I mean, we have very limited perspective. Um, whenever we consume entertainment ourselves. That's why it was really great having a team of five people that could watch it, bring their ideas to the table, because that's how we operated. It was like the, the five people were all creative in their own way, um, which is, I think, a requirement to work in advertising now. Like every, every job in the, in, in the industry requires creativity in some way. Account managers can be really creative, media buyers, to be creative in the way that they place um, social itself. Like I, you know, I started out wanting to be an advertising creative. I wanted to be a writer, um, but it doesn't always work that way. You know, like it, uh, you, you think that you're gonna get like this dream job and it's gonna, you know, work out, but it doesn't always. So you kind of have to maybe take one that you don't necessarily want. So, um, which brings me to this first thing. Seeking the advice of a Sunspot Trivia Night guru. <laughs> this is my first email to someone. I followed up. I applied for this job that I was not at all qualified for. I was a project manager, a digital producer. Not anything that I would ever do, ever. Um, so I knew Laura, who's sitting in, in, the, in the crowd right now. I knew Laura from Sunspot when I was a server, she spoke of the class. I had applied to this position and I, you know, had heard back, don't apply to any job on their website. Find someone with a name and email them. Don't ever, don't ever just apply to the, the job listing, but use it as a guide. If you know that it's out there, you know that they're looking, that's great. Find a recruiter, the director of recruitment is always a good person to find for any agency or any, basically any position. You don't, don't talk to a robot. Like that's that's kind of like, that, that's the whole point, is we wanna make this human connection. So I, um, I followed up with Laura and it was perfect timing. It couldn't have been a better time. So she, this is my cover letter. It's really dumb, you guys, cover letter. I, I talked to my director of recruitment at Sidley and she said no one reads cover letters anymore. It's true. They don't. Yeah, no one, no one reads those things. Uh, so don't waste your time like trying to come up with something stupid like this. Um, just make sure that your email is really good, you know? And I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so this is all about like structuring my service experience into advertising experience. I really tried to tried to relay like how the service industry had prepped me because I didn't have any internships. You know, I had no advertising internships whatsoever. You know, I didn't really have a leg to stand on when it came to like applying for any, even an entry level position in advertising. Like it would, it would be 
a major risk to, to try to bring me in to think that I could actually do it. So this is what got me in the door. And it couldn't have been better sending that to Laura because she knew me from the restaurant. And I didn't write this for her specifically. I, at the time, I didn't even put two and two together until after I applied and started to like, you know, wanted to reach out. This was the first job that I applied to. I didn't, I didn't apply to any other job after school. Um, and it worked out. That's what I got. It was, I mean, it was, that was all I needed to hear. So I came in and I, I, I came in for the interview and um, we're talking and, and, and she's, she poses this question. So what do you think of social media? And at the time, here I was out of college. I had just moved back from Colorado um, and I didn't think of the role as being a social media position at all. For some, I don't know why I didn't think that. I thought advertising. That's it. Blanket statement there. And she's like, so, what do you think of social media? And I'm like, eh, eh it's, it's okay. You know you're applying, interviewing for a social media position, right? I was like, let me, let me explain a little bit. Backtracked, spun it. You gotta be quick on your feet when you when it comes to this stuff, but it turned into you know a role that I had for two and a half years at Tombers. Um, you guys are all familiar with Tombers, right? Huge now. At the time it was 80 employees, uh, I think around 80, and now it's like almost tripled in size. So they're doing something right. Um, so turn that social media job, which I didn't necessarily want. I, I, it was not something that like appealed to me. I wanted to be an advertising creative, like a writer, go to portfolio school or not, and and got in there and realized that I definitely turned that into a writing job. It was all writing. The whole thing was writing, but at the same time, I learned all these other like skills that you need to, to actually manage business, which traditional portfolio schools aren't gonna teach you, which I think, such you guys, like you guys, like the education that you get at UT is very, you know, it's 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 broad and specific in your classes, but you you come out a little more well rounded. You understand a little bit of every facet of advertising, and then you can hone in on on what you really want to get out of it. Um, the job in social media really prepared me just to work in advertising in general. Um, so never underestimate like your experience. And the next lesson for you all is you have to flirt sometimes. So that that first job came pretty easily as far as job searching goes. First email that I sent, first job that I applied for, and it worked. So two and a half years later, my ego got a little bit bigger. I decided I needed to move. So I walked into the corner office at Tombers and told them that I was gonna to move to California. They were cool with it. I got to work remotely for three months and then I just quit. It was like the dumbest thing I've ever done. I just, I, I quit. I went AWOL, didn't answer the phone. Social media is honestly, it's pretty, it's mentally taxing to be upfront with you guys. It takes a lot. I mean, you guys are on it yourselves. Whenever you're running it for a brand, do it properly. It takes immersing yourself in it. You have to become it. It's, it's it's tough. So I like turned my phone off for one day whenever I really shouldn't have and just never turned it back on and ended up quitting. Then I was unemployed for three months in like a big market in LA. No one would give a shit about Tom Brits in Tennessee. They didn't know anything that I had done before. They didn't care about Farmer Charlie. They didn't care about like McDonald's for the local Tennessee market. They didn't care about that stuff. And it's really hard to show social media creative. It's not an easy thing to build a portfolio around social media work. Out of context, it's really tough to like, to get that stuff. So I had to flirt a lot. I applied to 80 different jobs, some of them multiple times. And I only got two, like two interviews out of that. One was, a no-go, I wouldn't have worked out there at all. The next one was this agency called Mistress. So by the name, 
you kind of like it. They're a little edgy. They're they're a little different, you know. And they they really they 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 lived that. That was their their brand. That's they referred to mistress as she. It was um it so it was gonna require a little bit of flirting to get in the door there. So this is like my stock my stock cover letter email kind of thing. If you guys want to read it, you can. Um, also, one note, the, the stack of pirated Tony Robbins CDs is actually a reference to my pump-up jam before I went to my very first interview with Laura. I honestly had a pirated version of Tony Robbins and I was using it to like pump myself up as I was sitting in the parking lot about to go in and do business, you know? Um, so, I tried to, tried to really get their attention. You know, there's nothing spectacular about this whatsoever. I just wanted a response. It's all that I cared about. So, I got one. <laughs> and here I was, three months unemployed. Don't do that ever, okay? Never ever leave a job that you have to hope that you can get another job. It doesn't work that way ever. It's always on the other, like the, the, the job's time. It's never gonna be on your own time. It never works that way. So, I got I got the mistress's attention. Aya, I love her. I've got a bunch of more emails from her. So, just to kind of keep an eye on this date right here. Guys, it goes to show that it never works whenever you need it to. So like, here I am. I would do anything to get my foot in the door of this place. I really loved the agency. It wasn't like, it was desperate, but it was also the agency that I wanted to work for whenever I moved out there. Um, so I really put it all in. Wait, let's see here. Okay, so I'm gonna show you guys some, some real stuff. This is my response back to that. Um, I'm glad to hear from you. I'm aware of both of those details, so consider expectations managed. Regarding salary, I told her, you know, straight up. Keep this in mind whenever you communicate. It's actually illegal now in California to ask someone's salary range for what they made at another job. I just found this out. Um, but I was really, really interested. So I like where Mistress's head is at. I can flex if I need to because, like, sometimes whenever you whenever you ask that question, you don't really know how to answer that question at all. You know, and it's scary because you don't want them to ignore you. You don't want it to be too high, but you don't want it to be too low for yourself. I was too high. So I didn't hear anything back at all. Several days later, like two weeks later, finally I followed up and I'm just like, hey, what's going on? Where's everything at? And I was I was way too high on the salary. So she let me know. But I was desperate. So I would take anything. It wouldn't have mattered at all. So I'm just like, okay, okay. I can work with that. Let's figure it out. I'll do whatever I can to like just get the opportunity itself. So <laughs> you gotta follow up, you know? Like if you want, hit me with the number you all have in mind or invite me in, I'll fall in love and money may not be an object. You gotta always like play the part, you know? Um, so this is where I ended up. <laughs> I ended up there. You can't live in LA for that. I'll just go ahead and tell you, you can't do it. You have to grind to get that. And it took a lot of work to, to get past that. But Mistress was one of the best experiences I've ever had. Culture at any place that you work is the most important thing. And it's it, it becomes like family. Like All the people that are there now, family. Um, I worked with that. Keep an eye on this date. 26, gave her my time. Never ever, like didn't respond back. Four days later, I had to like reply back to her. Hey, follow up. Like, where's everything going with this? I, you know, at what's going on? I hope I didn't make Mistress jealous with the availability. Uh, if there's time this week, let me know. So, Never underestimate the follow-up. Talk to a real person, and then you get 
the response sometimes. My mistressy ears were burning, just so you know. Um, so ended up going in, and uh, it was noted about character. They actually asked me if I wanted a shot of Jaeger whenever I walked in the door. Um, it was one of their brands at the time, so I worked on a bunch of alcohol accounts for them. So it was very in character. It was very out of character for me to decline the shot, <laughs> which they soon found out after I started there. But um, never like just always follow up. It's never gonna get on someone's nerves. Just don't follow up too much, you know. Like, and if you want to do something creative, be creative in the way that you follow up. But it's nice just to just to touch base, you know, just to let people know that you're still there. People get really busy, you know. Like I get LinkedIn messages all the time, and I want to respond, but sometimes you don't, you know. And like you just have to keep on. Like it's not anything against you a lot of the time. It's really just everyone else's attention. Um, people are super busy. That's why you need to reach out to recruiters, not necessarily like the people that are working on stuff, like reaching out to creatives, aren't gonna, they're not gonna get you in there, it's too competitive for that, so always reach out to a recruiter. Um, so ended up, just long story short here, got the job of mistress, it ended up, it, it was it was tons of fun, I worked on Chambord Liqueur, you guys probably never had it, have you had it? Yeah, great in champagne, it's the only way it's great. Um, and it, you know, this, this got me in the door. So as soon as I got this job, that's when I stopped having to look for jobs. Um, I made my way into a market that was much bigger. Um, I worked at FX Networks for a total of two months. So I left Mistress after six months, went to FX Networks. It was terrible. I don't recommend it. And I quit. That's my trend, I guess. Uh, I quit because it wasn't right for me, you know? And when it's not right for you, it's not gonna be right for them at the same time. We worked way too hard to, to, to put all of our life and attention into something that we don't really believe in. So whenever you're looking for places to work, don't, don't just take every, like what you can get. Make sure it's the right fit. Like make sure it's something that you can really turn into something that you love, something that you can, that you can turn into like a quality experience. Um, so, this is my follow up to that. I went to FX for two months and went back to Mistress uh, to work on Narcos for Netflix. Um, in that, within that six month period of time, I took that 40 and increased it by 11 and got the biggest raise that Mistress has probably given because it's a startup. They don't pay very well. Um, but because I left, because like someone else wanted me, I was able to like leverage that. You know, always use that experience, but don't burn a bridge. Like I couldn't have gone back there if they didn't like me, you know? If, and I didn't, I left early, but I didn't leave on bad terms. I didn't burn that bridge like I did at Tombra's. <laughs> um, and I was able to go back, turn it into a, a, a decent raise for myself and worked on Narcos, which was the experience that got me to where I'm at now, working on Netflix. Um, without that, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have had the experience to actually manage the Netflix brand itself, uh, which is, they run that very differently from the way that they run the, the original show's account, uh, accounts. So, um, that's, Kind of like my work history right there, <laughs> like all the you know the glitz and the and the bad stuff, the the salary ranges and everything. What kind of questions do you guys have? So how did you get to Sidley? Sidley, okay. So an account director at Mistress left to go to Sidley, and he and I had worked together before. He then like. He then very subtly stole me from Mistress as soon as they were they were um, they were answering the RFP for Netflix. He knew because of my Narcos experience that I was able to to come in and, and run the account. 
because they needed to make money on on the business itself. They had to they had to like staff a really small team that could do a bunch of different stuff. So he brought me in um, from there. At the time, Sibley LA was only I was the fourth employee. We're at forty now. So like we closed the New York office and brought all of those people over to LA, and it's changed a lot in the the two years time that I've been there, but. Um, Jeremiah is his name. He brought me over from Mistress, and it was like it wasn't as easy as him saying like, you're going to be on there. Like I said earlier, he had to actually interview with Netflix to get the job at Sibley, which is very unusual. Not necessarily something that every like any agency is going to do, but because of how close we needed to work with them, it was it was part of building that trust, making sure that they felt like they had a say and actually you know, casting this team that they're gonna be working with. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I that's how it got there. Did they have an existing uh, content manager that you were replacing or? They had a different agency. Yeah, yeah they, they worked with a different agency and they ended that, that contract and they, they brought Sid Lee on for two years, which is exactly what happened with us. So there's a new agency working there totally changed the model so it's, it's nothing about us or them or anything it's just they they're doing it much differently now um, so yeah it was it was a different agency before and we had a good run like two years two and a half years is a, a long time to work on any one social brand um, things change a lot in a very small amount of time I'm sure you guys are aware I mean any update causes a platform to, to go up or down it's, it's insane so it's, it's a lifetime when it comes to social and working in social. So where do you, what, what's next for you? Like new agency, same agency, new project? Same agency. Um, in fact, like I'll be much more invested in Sidley itself because Netflix, it, it required way too much attention. Um, so much attention, like I said earlier, that I felt like I was working for Netflix. Um, so staying at Sidley, now with this experience, I turned that community manager job into like a creative position, the one that I always wanted to begin with, you know, like copywriter, but I feel like it's much more well-rounded because you have to write on your feet, you know, you have to come up with concepts and, and pitch video ideas. And we produced almost everything. Like working, it's like a much faster pace than, than traditional advertising or even, you know, not so traditional advertising nowadays. It's just really, really fast paced. Um, so now it's trying to slow things down, take the time that I have to, to breathe a little bit and think about stuff and just become a better creative with the experience that I have working on social and really making everything that we do for Sid Lee like a conversation starter and not just like a big Super Bowl spot or something like that. You know, it's, it's, it's really about trying to get people to, to talk. Um, because if you can't get someone to say something about it on social, then no one's going to care if it's on TV or on a billboard or wherever. Like it's it's all about that conversation factor. So I, you know, with Sibley, I expect to be bringing more of that mindset to the things that we do. Oh, <laughs> that's my. Uh, Background, I guess I can just leave it on that. Any more questions? <laughs> so what metrics did you, um, on your Netflix, what metrics were you used to evaluate success for? You guys are going to love this one. Okay. We didn't. <laughs> um, we didn't really, like, we didn't, they have a, a major analytics team, and they're data scientists that do that. It's, it's not something that we really focus on. We really cared about like engagement. Like what's the quality of the conversation that we're having? Like reach of course um, is a big thing, especially with Facebook and trying to make sure that it's, you know, it's actually delivering to the people that follow you. Um, shares are also another major factor, but it was all anecdotal. It's like we look at it Kind of get a gut reaction on how well we think it's going to do. It's not an exact science at all, uh, which is not the way to do analytics. So, do analytics. Like if you're going to be a data scientist, do it the right way. 
Um, but that's kind of like we gauge the conversation, we build a concept around what people are saying to try to mirror that mentality, that fandom. It's like the, the big thing that we would do with, with Netflix is just try to be the biggest fan of everything and know the ins and outs of all the shows and come up with those things. If it started a conversation or went went really big, then that's then we knew that it worked. Um, so that was kind of the way. It wasn't it, it wasn't an exact, an exact science at all, uh, but it worked out because I think we were making stuff that people like wanted, but didn't directly say that they wanted. Um, and you know, it was a good way to like be a fan of all the shows that we were that we were promoting, which. It's impossible to watch everything. There's too much stuff to actually do. So I really used that conversation. I mean, I would scroll through Twitter, keyword search. Like I didn't use any fancy tools. Uh, Crimson Hexagon was one that we would use every now and then if I needed to pull, you know, really specific mentions of stuff for a, a certain date range. But for the most part, I used just Twitter advanced search to to find everything that I needed to. And that's how I would craft a lot of the stuff that I would write. I would look at the way people talked about about shows and really understand the fandom around those shows by just the word selection. Like there are little things that you kind of pick up on as you read through thousands of tweets about uh, Narcos or Stranger Things. Like I, you know, I think that we this past October when Stranger Things two came out, I I, I would. I think we were the biggest fan of Stranger Things, and you would think you would expect that from Netflix, but I, I don't think anyone was a bigger fan than us, and that was major success for me. Like that was that was like all that we ever wanted out of anything that we promoted was to prove that we we were there with everybody watching it at the same time, and understood that like it, that it's a rabid fandom for Stranger Things. You guys love it, right? Um, so it was it was uh, it was a lot of fun working on that one. Um, you kind of hit on it briefly a little bit, but can you talk about like the difference between um, what work you did with the Netflix originals versus shows that came off of other um, programs? Definitely. Um, so so working on an original is very like for social it was very in world you follow any of those accounts, like the Stranger Things account, or Narcos, or any of them, there's one for every show. It's very, like, very in-world. It's supposed to be from the voice of yeah. someone within that, that world. Netflix, on the other hand, was as the fan, like the, the viewer, from an outside perspective, kind of looking in as that, that the watcher of the show. Um, so, like, that was, like, the biggest difference, but it was the it, it was it's a really fine line yeah it's tough it, and it's a line that we would constantly straddle but it got to the point where we would come up with ideas and if it's too original then we wouldn't do it mm -hmm. you know because it's for it's, it just doesn't yeah. come from that voice and each each account you know has its own like curated voice it's supposed to sound very unique to the show or the brand um, so it was like this a balancing act trying to figure out which one um, and you never really know like you never know it's like a gut feeling like once you work on something for a, a length of time you start to you just start to pick up on the way that you would talk about things um, from that perspective I mean it, it kind of becomes you in a way like if you if you manage an account um, that isn't your own personal brand it's so much easier to, to do social that way I am, I'm a very private person I don't, I don't, I don't have a personal brand when it comes to social media for myself, but it's so easy to get like in that mindset once you experience it for a little bit. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, for sure. Actually, it reminds me that I follow the House of Cards account. Yeah. And like Very that frank. one, like yeah. is totally exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Like even like tweeting about relevant political things yeah. that are happening, like especially during the election last year. Um, so like that sparked my memory. That's it's really it's cool. a, that's a great example. Frank Underwood. It, they basically take the the voice of Frank Underwood yeah. and they really apply it to the House of Cards account. It's, it's fantastic. Um, and they, I think another one that does a really good job is Black Mirror. Theirs is always like pretty relevant in t today. It's just, you know, they're always on it with the technology stuff, the, the pizza box delivery thing, it was great. They can turn the smallest bit of news into like a major tweet. Um, yeah. 
Uh, this is very specific, but I'm just kind of curious. So, like, for Stranger Things, for example, like, season two is about to be released, the entire season. Like, how would y'all prepare for, like, that day, knowing that everyone's going to be binge-watching it, tweeting about it? Like, how much preparation goes into that? Um, so, on the Netflix side of things, we had nothing prepared. <laughs> <laughs> We, we couldn't. I, mean, I, I couldn't see the yeah. episodes. I mean, yeah. there are shows that, that we would get access to that we could watch beforehand, come up with ideas. So you only get to see it before everyone else sees it. We did not. I did, however, get to live tweet this binge race event. They put put on this this big event for a bunch of super fans in LA and brought in people, some of the, like big super fans, put this put on this like whole event. Um, and they called it a binge race and these people were watching it we watched it for nine hours straight. So I was there, <laughs> yeah, in the crowd at this in this auditorium, just live tweeting like moments from the show, you know, with with the client. Like she was hanging out in a different room. I was in the auditorium taking video, coming up with tweets, reacting in real time. Which we used to do that a lot. Like the way that we worked on Netflix changed like drastically from day one to where they're at now, and a lot of that had to do with just how like we would start conversations, you know? So like we used to prepare a bunch of stuff and it wouldn't land. And it, you know, we put a lot of time into making this stuff that people don't really care about. Like it's just, we would latch onto the wrong thing or Barb would show up for season one and no one could have ever anticipated Barb being a thing, but she was. <laughs> so we took that and we started, you know, kind of waiting to see and basing it off of just the volume of the conversation around certain things. Um, and that's kind of the approach that we took for Stranger Things 2. So we did this live tweet, it was fun, like hadn't done that in a really long time, and it's the only show that you can really do that for, because like, you know everybody's up watching it and it's totally fine, but because all the episodes come out at one time, it's, it's kind of tough, to, you can't really, it's not, you don't program around it, it's, you kind of make references to certain episodes and there are always going to be people that haven't watched it yet and are like, spoiler alert. <laughs> we don't give a shit about spoilers. <laughs> no one cares about spoilers. Like, you can't. Whenever you're working on that kind of stuff, it just doesn't work. Um, so it was it was really like in the moment. And it worked out for that one. And then days after, we would start, like, we just, we were all really big fans of the show. And we'd already seen all the episodes having the context of seeing all the episodes and kind of just being fans ourselves, we were able to come up with ideas on the, like, kind of on the spot, you know? And, and um, there are a couple of Easter eggs that we discovered from, from the Netflix account, which we didn't know about. Like, the Stranger Things guys don't tell you about that stuff. They want people to find it out. Um, so that was, uh, that's kind of how we worked on it. You talked a lot about Twitter um, Talk about um, creating content for other platforms and also what you see as being the most relevant platforms for brands going forward. I know that's kind of a broad question. But, yeah. You know, is it Snapchat? Is something else fading away? You know, what do you, what do you think? Um, well, I think creating content, I mean, you have to be a citizen of each platform to really make stuff that's relevant. You can't, you know, think that a, a Facebook post is going to blow up on Twitter. It's, it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes things will, you know, but. Usually, like, you know, if you come up with something, you just have to understand how people act on certain platforms. I'm not a big fan of Snapchat. I'm just not, I, I kind of, I think I'm a little too old for it for some reason, but I've been talking to my little sister about it, and I, start, I understand the function of it now, you know, and it's it's replacing text is kind of the way that I see it as, as direct communication with your friends. I don't see a lot of impact for brands doing that until they, you know, I, I just don't see it working, but it could, you know, if, if a brand did it the right way. I think um, for Facebook, figuring out the algorithm and just being on it and being active, I think is, is a really important thing, trying to just like understand, especially from a brand perspective, because they're changing things to be, like to, to serve you up less, like quality stuff is what they say. Um, so it's, I don't know, it's, you just have to try stuff out. Like experiment, know that it's not gonna last for forever. You know, if, if it works, then great. Keep doing stuff like that, but don't keep doing the same thing. And that, I think that's the biggest learning as far as like creative goes. Like you have to keep it fresh. 
I mean, my favorite follow on on Facebook right now is Super Deluxe. Like they make some of the craziest shit, and I I love it. You know, like they just they constantly churn out a bunch of random stuff that gets my attention, fills my feed because I always want to watch it, um, and they they just try whatever sticks, you know, and they'll they'll do it. Uh, for Twitter, right now, I mean, really absurd brands are like the thing. I don't know if when that's ever gonna go away. Like people just love that context of hearing something stupid from a brand for some reason. Um, I don't know. I don't get it, but I love it. You know, it's fun. Uh, <laughs> um, those are like the main platforms that I, that I work on. Instagram is going to continue to be like something very curated, playing around with stories and just being like just being ready to to make something new whenever they come out with new functionality. Um, because you know it's it's always nice to get ahead of that stuff and, and just playing around. I think the stories are are really interesting. I think my favorite follow on Instagram right now is Pablo Rochad or something like that. He makes a bunch of really um, really funny like Instagram stories that are interactive so you like use the tap function to to make make everything happen it's really really funny so check that out um, I hope I answered your question well enough <laughs> I think, so there are like three different phases, like you could be always like on, and where it was like, it was second nature, like I would just, you know, check it like I was checking my own personal stuff, but it required so much more attention, so if you see something interesting, turn it around, because like, I, I didn't have approvals or anything, I could do whatever we needed to do right then and there, I could come up with a tweet and go with it, I didn't have to like get anyone sign off or anything like that, so whenever anything is happening, but it also turned into working pretty much every weekend, and you don't really realize how precious your attention is until you're working 24 seven and you don't really know it. Um, then there's just like casual monitoring, I guess, like we would we post stuff, but you don't wanna just like let it go, because like we really came to life in the comments of any platform that we're on, it's always in the responses, like the, the, the creative is only to get that conversation for the most part. That's all we really cared about is what people were saying in the responses or the replies or the comments. So that's where we would always just kind of be in there, actually talking to people, you know, cracking jokes or, you know, responding to, to you know, questions or just trying to have fun with everyone in there like we're still active. Um, so it's, it, I mean, it was an always on kind of thing. But don't let that scare you, it's fun. Like it's, it's a lot of fun like to think that you get to paid to play around on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and any platform pretty much. And a lot of the time you can have a lot of creative freedom to do stuff. Like I said earlier, it's gonna go away. Like you're gonna scroll past it, you know, it's not gonna last forever. You're not gonna mess anything up for the most part unless you like do something like really, really dumb and <laughs> say something you don't want, copy and paste the wrong thing. Um, so. Going all the way back to the beginning, how you mentioned Sunspot. Do you genuinely think that, like, probably at the time where you thought it was just like, like a small little part time job, do you really think that had that big of an impact, like that small like, survey experience on how far you've gone already? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be here if I didn't have that experience, honestly. It gives me hopes I used to serve on Sunspot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I mean, no, it honestly, it, it, I wouldn't be as well rounded of. An employee as I am now because that serving experience really prepares you for just like this advertising PR all of it's like a service you know that we provide to the client or the community that we're that we're working for and it teaches you a lot of like community communication skills I was always like a pretty I was a nervous anxious guy until I started working at the restaurant I started at Aubrey's when I was 16 and I was a host there. Worked my way, and when I started going to, when I started at UT, I started serving at, at, at Sunspot. And I mean, I, it 
gave me valuable networking connections. You know, I wouldn't have met Laura otherwise. I wouldn't have had that 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 ability to like reach out to her and feel confident in that ability. It's the reason why she she felt I was capable of doing the the job was because of that service experience. It was you know it's all it is is like making sure customers are happy and entertained a lot of the time and and are like are heard like you know it's it's one of those things where you just. That's how social is kind of used nowadays. Um, it's being present and checking in on everybody. So totally, like I, I wouldn't be here if I didn't have that experience. And you know, I, I would never undervalue an internship. So if you can get those, get them, use them as much as you can. But just like try to get as most like the most out of it as you can. Like I don't really believe in job titles anymore. I think that any good employee is going to go above and beyond. Like any role description and just do what you want to do while you're there and just like be ready to help and not get bogged down by oh I'm not supposed to do that it's not that's not me you know I don't do that do it all you know like try everything like see what you're good at see what you really like and what really sticks and just, just try it out and push forward and y'all if I can piggyback on one thing Chet said I know some people give you advice to not put uh, major specific um, work on your resume and this is just an example of yeah I mean you're a server you're a lifeguard you're a nanny put all that on there yeah. that that's your life experience and that's where you learn so much and so I don't get the school of thought that says only put your one internship you know lots of Carmichael that you had your senior year yeah. I want to know what you were doing when you were 16 and did you pay your way through school and you know what life lessons you learned so yeah I mean it honestly gets really sterile looking at a bunch of one page resumes that all say the same thing. No one likes to read a resume. Like it's not fun. Like I said earlier, cover letters suck. No one's gonna read that shit. Resumes are even worse, but you have to read that. But having something on there that you're confident in, like like serving experience or anything, like can really speak to your character in a way. And when it comes down to it, you want that resume to kind of reflect a little bit of who you are and how you come to be who you are. And it, it does that really well, you know. Like, if you read a bunch of just just random inter like like internships with we did this project or this thing, it just doesn't. I don't know. You whenever you craft a resume, make sure it's something that you want to read yourself because no one else is going to want to read it, you know. And if you can't make yourself read it, you know, it's going to be a hard time getting someone's attention. So that was it's it's. I'm glad you brought that up because it's it's really important. I. I think I still have my sunspot experience on my resume because it, it is really valuable and it's a talking point because like you wonder why someone would keep that on there because it is something that it's not it's not something that you always like you want to feature but it, it's it's quality. Anything else? No. Let's all give chance around. <laughs>